So, hello, sir. Hello, how's it going? Hey, I saw you here and um, I wanted to mention, you look like you're from the Doctor Who universe. Oh, very much so. Yeah. 50 years, I think it's a safe bet. 50 years, <laughs> okay. And I wanted to know, because I'm not familiar with Doctor Who, I mean, I've, I know a lot of people love it. A lot of my friends tell me that it's great. Indeed. I've seen a scarf around that people reference lately. That's yes. Who. Well, that, that's, that's like a badge of honor for a lot of people you know, it, years ago when, that, when the uh, fourth Doctor wore it back in the 1970s. That, so for the longest time, people were like, oh, that's a bloke with the scarf, isn't it? Cool. Yeah. So it's, I, I like references like that. And yeah. I kind of wanted to know, all right, people love this. There's a lot of references to it. So, so um, I was curious about that. And I wanted to know, when it comes to a series like Doctor Who, where do we start? Because I know there's a lot of history. Well, for a lot of people, especially in the case of Americans, um, it's always, I, I feel it's personally best to start with the, the new series with Chris Breckelstein and move forward from there, like you do with any television series. Mm -hmm. And then once you uh, become up to speed on that, then I say, you know, jump back and start watching the classic series. But you don't, you're not required to have to start at the dead beginning, move forward. There are actually some wonderful stories um, from different eras that you start with because one thing I've discovered with modern audiences nowadays, we, you know, we love production value, we love special effects. But the thing is, the series back then, like most television series back then, we're not mm -hmm. famed for their elaborate special effects. That's basically, so we watch Star Trek, the old Star Trek, and we're like, I can see the seam on the mustache. <laughs> That's not working. Yeah. yeah. It's not working there. But so you really have to cash in more on the story and the acting. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, Doctor Who being from England, they invented acting and right. they invented good writing. So. That's kind of what kept the show going. Actually, it's good storytelling is the major thing that kept that show running for so long, and that's why it's still as popular as it is you know, for 50 odd years. Great, great. I, I wanted to, as you were discussing this, mentioning this, um, you said the special effects. It reminds me of Red Dwarf. Is Red Dwarf also British? Special effects, not the best at the start, especially, but there's still a charm to that. It's, and a lot of it has to do with the characters. You love the characters, yeah. and, and the writing is. It, that's all you need. Yeah, frankly, in the end, anything, that's all you need. Like, after all, you watch Evil Dead 2, the special effects are pretty rubbish, but you know what, you watch it because it's bloody hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. So, and then, um, okay, so we can start at the new series and go back, all right. Yes, um, and well, actually, I mean, even after you're done with the new series, you can actually step back and watch this Doctor. Right. Because this was the, uh, this is the variation of Paul McGann, as played by Paul McGann, in 1996. Uh, when the series ended in 89, there was a demand to bring the show back. And then uh, one gentleman produced a television film by, through Fox and the BBC and, um, in 1996. And that's when the show really started to see what it would look like with good production value and even better acting. But that's when you had Paul McGann playing this variation. So I always tell people, OK, you're done. Watch television film because it's kind of like a nice bridge to take mm -hmm. you back a bit. So would you say, so? This one that had in 96 had better special effects a little bit? Um, I will say, it, it, yes, I will say, and not only that, the sets were incredible. I mean, that's where they took everything that was we knew about the past, but they just blew it even more out of proportion. It was epic. I mean, you had this TARDIS interior set, which looked like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells had a baby, and they built a house. Very nice. It looked incredible. That's great. <laughs> and then I would probably say, or you correct me if I'm wrong, that this that particular installment was instrumental in igniting the flame that kept Doctor Who alive? Well, I would say so. I mean, it, there was always a demand to bring the show back. Okay. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, they, they tried to promote it strictly in America, and they aired it the same night as the Roseanne finale, and I, I don't oh. think that particularly... Yeah. However, in Britain, it did really well, okay. and, it was, and it fueled even further the demand to bring the show back. But in time, they actually... One thing's about the Doctor Who fandom, which has another reason why it's survived for so long, is because the fans actually have found alternate means to keep it alive. I mean, they, they had the novelization, they had novels with original adventures. And then uh, some gentleman uh, from a group called Big Finish did audio adventures, CDs, radio plays, where they actually brought back uh, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth Doctor. Mm -hmm. and, they did a, uh, and they did radio plays of the series, brand new adventures. Right. So it was like getting new Doctor Who. And it, it was basically like nice, a nice little way to tide you over until the show finally did come back. That's great. And it's still going on to this very day because you have a lot of fans who are like saying, oh, I love that Doctor, I want to see more of him. And you can, you can get more of them. Especially in my case, since this Doctor only had the one off. Right. And now I've got more, more to go with and it's wonderful. That's great, for him specifically, for that yeah. Doctor. Yes, Paul McGann, uh, I, in my opinion, was an absolutely wonderful Doctor. He was very, he had, he had a very whimsical demeanor. He, was very, he had a offbeat romantic edge to him. But he was very sweet, had a bit of innocent side to him. Mm -hmm. So 
when because so he was what got me into it, and when I saw his performance of it, he's like, there's this brilliant scene where he's talking about the awe-inspiring brilliance of this meteor storm, and then he just stops and realizes these shoes fit amazingly. <laughs> and I was I like, like that. I've never seen a hero, a sci-fi hero, yeah. focus on these beautiful things. Most of them are like, oh, Greedo, bang. Yeah. No. And, and then how do you how does your brain go from that sight to my shoes are great? You it's know, just because he's. The Doctor himself, he's just one of those characters who just really kind of loves loves the little things in life. I mean, he's one of those ones that, yes, he'll he'll go to a great planet, but then at the end of the day, he'll just enjoy a nice cup of tea mm -hmm. and just have a nice sit down. And cool. that's and that's him. And is that, but that's not the case for all Doctors. This is a special... No, act, well, I mean, every single Doctor... See, one of the things that kept the show going, another thing, was the fact that every actor who's played him had their own little specific spin on it, which mm -hmm. gave it this sort of charm. I mean... A lot of people with uh, David Tennant, you know, the bloke with the uh, pinstripe suit, mm -hmm. you know, with the spike with the spiky hair. He was he pr practically invented geek chic. He was like the, oh, that's brilliant, that's exciting. Oh, that's brilliant, that's exciting. Oh my God, he, he was very <laughs> full of life, and people clicked to that. Then you have the current incarnation, as played by Matt Smith, who is the, you know, slightly loopy individual, is very unpredictable. He's like the. Maybe you want to use that on that on him. What is that? Uh, this only works on things that he might be deadlocked. No. He's definitely dead. Okay. That might yeah. And that so. works on living things only. Well, it's a it's a screwdriver. It doesn't okay. it doesn't kill. It doesn't, doesn't wound. You doesn't want to kill. Just adjust. If there's any issue with his armor or something, you can adjust. But that, that thing's dead. Yeah, yeah. That, that's dead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, that, nothing we could do with that. That's good. <laughs> so screwdriver, you were saying. Oh well. The thing was, when the show, when the first Doctor kicked off, yeah, he was a kind of crotchety grandfather figure. But then, and then when he changed over, people were like going, "Oh no, it's not going to be good." Then, this actor dared to just play completely differently, and mm -hmm. it carried over, and people just loved. And now, it's 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 actually the only series in history where they change, they look forward to changing the cast member because they like seeing what they're going to add to it. Okay, okay. Yeah, actually, now uh, they just announced a new Doctor coming out uh, next year, played by Peter Capaldi, mm -hmm. and. People are excited because they don't know what he's going to do with it. Right. I mean, all, I mean, they've seen the actor, they know him, but and they know him playing this very irascible political figure. That you, know, but we're like, what is he going to do with this character? And that's the anticipation. That's what keeps the show going. It's just people going, what is, what's going to happen next? It's a show that thrives on change. That's cool. Um, it's almost like, you know, I can relate it a little bit to music. I like bands that experiment. Yes. That's always really cool. Yes, and and frankly, if the show is not experimenting, it's not doing its job. Because the thing is, because the show can go anywhere, literally, through time and space, mm -hmm. you, there's no foundation. There's no, all you really need is eccentric alien, travels with a companion through time and space. Mm -hmm. And because you can go anywhere, you literally can take the show anywhere with the stories. I mean, there was even a story in the 60s where they actually end up in a land of fiction, mm -hmm. where they actually meet D'Artagnan, and they meet Cyrano de Bergerac, and they meet uh, Gulliver. And because it's Doctor Who, and because it's the kind of show that takes it there, you can believe it. You can, you, it sells it perfectly. There's a foundation to yes, believe Yes, exactly. That. Because the whole idea is that you're wandering, you're going anywhere. You can, you can believe that this is a universe where stone angels can kill you if you blink. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's like that. Or that, mat, that shop window dummies can like, come alive and try to kill you. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of world, and you believe it because it sells it with total conviction. Even if it's ridiculous, it will sell it. That's great. As a matter of fact, the more ridiculous it is, the more fun it is. I and, I, and I think that's what that has over any other science fiction series in the world, frankly. Yeah. I mean, most of them just want to be serious. Like, Battlestar Galactica is like, oh, we have to be serious because the mankind's at stake. The Doctor's like, let's have some fun. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah, you know, apocalyptic thing happening going here. Yes, we'll stop it, but you know what? We're going to be stylish while we do it. You have a great time. It's nice. It reminds me of the more you talk about this, that it's in community. There's Abed, who has like an imagination room or something like that. Yes. And he's with Troy, and they play around quite a bit with that. And it's always very amusing. But now I'm realizing, in a world where anything can exist, like Doctor Who. Yes. That's kind of like a parallel. Is that like a reference or an homage to it? An homage to it? And um, I mean, surely there's an episode of. I remember an episode of Inspector Space Time. Mm. That's a direct reference. Oh yes, it, it, actually, I mean that is a testament to the impact the show had. Mm -hmm. And I even love that. I, I mean, I did see the bit where they make a little reference. And pretty much that one little reference, which set off an entire internet phenomenon. Definitely, yeah. Very much the untitled series about a traveler in time and space, as what is apparently called, but we don't say that. 
But the fact that Doctor Who's had such an impact that in American TV now that they're making mm -hmm. these little subtle homages to it and mm -hmm. people are totally picking up on it. I, I even, if I remember correctly, there was even another show actually in that reboot of Knight Rider, I think there was an episode of a character dressing up as Captain Jack Harkness right. here as well. And they're, and they're going, he's omnisexual, he's not gay. <laughs> Sort of thing, but that's okay. showing how the. So it has a lot of impact, yeah. Yes, or well, actually, I mean, the thing that's amazed me, I mean, I've been a fan since 1996 before it, when it was still a bit of a non entity in the United States. It does my heart good that when the fifth series was kicking off, all of a sudden I'm flipping through my Entertainment Weekly and all of a sudden I'm seeing multiple page adverts. Mm -hmm. for, I was like, I've never seen that. And then I find out in Los Angeles they have a billboard on the side of the freeway, big one, of Matt Smith just floating in space. I'm like, Oh, this is getting big. It is. Yes. Yeah. And I love that here we are right now. And now that, and now with the uh, Doctor Who parade doing extremely well, I mean, the fact that I'm looking around seeing children who are like four years old wearing tweed jackets, bow ties, and sonic screwdrivers in their hands. I, it, it, it's a wonderful time to be a Doctor Who fan. Cool. I think it's a great time for me to start. I, I, think, I think it's the best time because, you know, one thing, great things about the internet in particular is that you have plenty of means to learn where to kick off. Yeah, but I think the key thing is watch it and have a great time. Cool. Yeah, that's all, that's all there is to it, because that's the testament of the show. Just just go along for the ride and have a great time. All right. Um, you mentioned Battlestar earlier. Yes. Now, the watch order I remember in Battlestar is a bit strange. You have to, it's very complicated. Doctor Who, it's not so, I, I'm asking you, is it like that in Doctor Who? Or is it more so just that there's an abundance of content, but they're like chronologically quite clear in how to progress through them? Well, I mean, for a series that's been around for 50 years, I mean, it's going yeah. to have a pretty substantial continuity. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I mean, there are some, I mean, that's why I personally recommend you start with this, the first series, because the way it's written, you don't have to know, that, especially the first episode with uh, Chris Reckleston, it put, puts it through the point of view of the character Rose, his companion, so it eases you into it, so you don't have okay. to know everything that happened before. So that's the latest series? Well, yeah, in the new series, uh, the first episode, Rose, is what it's called. Okay. You start with that one because narratively it's brilliant because it puts you through the point of view of, of the uh, supporting female lead, played by Billy Piper. You just you, you follow the story through her as she gradually discovers the Doctor. You are gradually discovering it with her. That's brilliant. That's a great yeah. device. Oh, and yeah. actually, and ironically, that's how it started in the very first episode. They just simply said, let's just follow the device of the very first episode. Same thing. Perfect. It's like, well, it, it might be a little too much to just boom, here's this, here's this guy. But that, but that's what they did the first episode. They they told it through the POV of these two school teachers who were curious about the doctor's, you know, granddaughter, and they and they follow her, and all of a sudden they're in this police box and it's bigger on the inside, and then all of a sudden their minds are blown. And with it, so is the audiences. Mm -hmm. They just realized, they just walked into something they just never never knew existed. And it's amazing, it's brilliant. That's great. I'm looking forward to discovering it after hearing. You know, I could keep going and going. <laughs> so it's such a fascinating, fascinating show. So I'll look into that. It's really great meeting you. Um, I don't know if I asked your name, your name? Uh, John Reed Adams. OK, and you, you're you from Britain, probably. Am I? I don't know. I don't know. Are you? You decide, weren't you? Bit of a twist, all right. All right. All right. But uh, in terms of Dragon Con, first visit? Actually, no, uh, this is my fifth visit, fifth. as a matter of fact. That's cool. And yeah. I take it, go ahead. Uh, no, I come up from Orlando like every, like okay. as many times as possible. So this is my fifth time out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's a party. I mean, come on, you know, name any other place in the, in the entire world this time of the year. People getting dressed up and having an absolute complete laugh and with your mates and having a great time all night. Right. All night long. It's brilliant. It's, that's. <laughs> It's like Party Central after to like totally. 9 p.m. typically. And where, where are you going to see that? Where yeah, else are you going to see know. that? A, All that. It's a guy from Hotline Miami. Yeah. I know. I love the references. I love them. Exactly. I, I mean, mean, yeah, brilliant thing. And another thing I love about Dragon Con is also the place where someone can dress up as something completely obscure. Yeah. And you guarantee at least a couple of people are going to get it. I just saw a bloke dressed yesterday as uh, Naven Johnson from The Jerk, Steve Martin from The Jerk. With little, I haven't seen it. You've never seen that film? No. It was a great bit where, he, where a guy's trying to kill him. And he, and he keeps hitting oil cans, and he actually has the oil cans with little oh, oil nice. coming That's out of good. it. That's so he's good. Like, and I was like, and he even has the glasses. And I was like, only a Dragon Con <laughs> where you're going to see con. someone doing that. Are you familiar with Red Dwarf? Oh, totally. You saw it all? Okay. Not all of it, but okay. yeah. I, I know. I was just, but I do have my favorite episodes. My favorites were on the Backwards Planet, 
Okay. Where, they, where they go into play where everything's backwards. Yeah, yeah. Or um, what was it the one quarantine where Rimmer gets possessed by uh, and starts dressing in a plaid dress and a little. But hat. see, that's that's exactly what I wanted to lead you to because um, was it last year? Last year, and you know the IT crowd probably. I've heard of it. It's, it's quite cool. Check it out. Yeah, I've heard. I heard it's quite good. Yeah. I heard it's basically the show you want to watch when you don't like the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Big Bang still, it's amusing, but... Um, yes, but we really don't say Benzinger. Yeah. No, no, you find me a person who says Benzinger, really. Really. Well, maybe it's becoming a thing now. They kind of infuse society with it. <laughs> no. Just because television... No tells, Benzinger. Just because television tells you to do it doesn't mean you have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a meme. It's starting. Yeah. What I wanted to mention is that dress that Rimmer was dressed in. Yeah, yeah, the, the plaid. Was dressed in, yeah. yeah, with the puppy lemon stocking bits. Yeah. yeah, I met um, a guy dressed up as Moss, who's actually regular. We typically yeah. interview him. He he told me that he saw someone that dressed up as Rimmer, but the version in the yes. dress. Yes. Like that's insane. Oh, yeah. That's one episode. Yes, yeah, just one episode. Yeah. But and it's brilliant and it's great because that episode clicks with them, and and the best part is they'll know that there's going to be one person out there who gets it, mm. and then. And, and, and you just made that person's day because yeah. they're like, oh my god, there's someone who thinks the same th way I do. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, what was it? I mean, one day I want to get some mates together and do a Hudson Hawk group. Mm -hmm. Just because. A Hudson what? Sorry. Hudson Hawk. This, uh, you know, very this one, one of the greatest flops in cinema history, starring Bruce Willis. Very silly film. I just want to do it just to say we did it. Right. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. But you know what? You do it because it's hilarious. That's why you do it, and that's why I love that's, Dragon that's Con, and that's why Dragon Con's brilliant because it's this is the place where you do the where you embrace the ridiculous. Yep. And even if there are a few people that that recognize the the reference, even if there are a few, yeah, they will appreciate it so yes. much more because it's like oh, damn, because because yeah. it, because there's someone you can click with, and, and you know friendships are made when someone sees someone who knows what they know, and they come to you, and they'll be like, that's amazing. I, I never I thought I was the only person who knew about this. Yeah. And they come to you, and you end up having a nice long chat. You're having drinks, and then all of a sudden, your friends on Facebook. Next thing you know, boom, you're collaborating on a film. That's how it works around here, and that's that. And that's why I love it. Dragon Con. Dragon Con. We're just a subtle pitch here. Dragon Con, everybody, come to Dragon Con. All right. All right. Pleasure talking to you, sir. Pleasure, pleasure, sir. I will check out Doctor Who. It's about totally. time. About time, mate. A bit of a pun. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks.